turns out that most of the stuff that is that we have discussed applies to big data as well and so so you know that is there and then how big data can be used for networking as well is the is the last part third part so so for, so as you can see the whole big data was enabled by networking if the networking the advances were not there then you would not have virtualization we have discussed we have spent so much time on virtualization and um, and uh, and that virtualization made the cloud possible and the cloud made the fast computing and the large storage possible and as a result now we can do big data i mean big data problems have been around for 10 to 15 years but um, but it was not possible for everybody to do, uh, do these things uh, now with the with the virtualization and the cloud anybody can do big data and that's why it has become so popular now the next slide is map reduce we have already done it um, i just wanted to remind that um, um, what we need to do for big, the, the way the data is done now is that we divide the work into many computers and we want to make sure that the people the computers that are doing the work also have the data so right on this slide we show the people who the, the computers that are doing the work and we call them task um, uh, task agent uh, the the task node and on the next slide, we have the data node. The data node are where the data is. So one of the things that the Google said in their original paper, we really need to keep the data local. We need to keep the data exactly where the compute nodes are. So even though it shows on this picture only the data nodes, but these are also the compute nodes. Okay. And if you want to do computation on, let's say, on on um, B1, B2, or B3, you would just use the leftmost um, node here, uh, shown because that is where the data is. And this is different from the previous way of arranging storage, where previously storage was a whole different rack. So in one rack they will have a storage, the whole rack in the data center will have a storage with, with, with the disk arrays, and then they will connect, use the fiber channel to connect them to, to the, uh, another rack where they will have all the computers. So that is changed now. So basically what we have is local storage. All right. And so local computation. So even though we have two names here, data node and the task node. So next slide. The task tracker and the and, and the data node, they are same, one and the same. You see it says DN plus TT. DN plus TT means you know you just really want DN and TT to be the same node. All right. And um, so how do you do that? And that is what is possible with networking now, which was not possible before. So there are five things that the big data needs for in terms of networking. First, it needs to make sure that you can do the computation at the same place where the data is. So the code and the data co-location. Right? The second thing is that um, the network should be able to handle uh, the big variability in the demand because basically what happens is <coughs> basically what happens is that um, when you have map reduced lots of map jobs get done at the same time and suddenly there is a whole avalanche of data coming to the reduced reduce, um, processors and so so that's so the network needs needs to be able to handle that kind of thing, right? Third is the fault and the error handling. So that is another thing is that you know we we, we keep the data on three different nodes, we keep the computation on three different nodes, and if anything fails, the, the job is still complete. Security. Um, so that's another part. Basically, we haven't gotten into security in our networking issues, but. Um, with all the VLANs and other things, it's only authorized users can get the access to the data, other people cannot. Synchronization is the map jobs should be comparable. So that's another thing is that when you have, when you divide the map, when you divide the jobs, uh, you want to make sure that they all are similar because if, if one job is very big and it takes a day to finish and the other jobs are very small and are finished in few hours, then the reduced jobs are just waiting, doing nothing. They, have, they cannot reduce really, I mean, they can reduce piece by piece, but it is much easier for them if they get all the pieces together. So how this is possible, right? 
I mean, I can finish some of these right here and then go through the other ones later on. First, code data location, actually, uh, we will spend more time in the next few slides. But synchronization is very easy. Basically, what you do is, when you divide the jobs, if they are not equal, then you just give more processing capacity to the job that needs more processing capacity. I mean, basically, you don't have to run 10 VMs on every pro on every physical machine, you could run two on one, three on other, and five on uh, the other one. And so what happens is that the more VMs are there, the less uh, powerful that VM becomes. And therefore, when you, you, can, you have two controls here. You have the job size and you have the VM size. They can be both controlled so that you know, the jobs finish almost simultaneously. All right? So now we go to the next slide about the code and data co-location. Um, before actually I go to code, data, and location, let me just tell you what recently happened in networking. So first of all, the speeds went up. We have 100 gigabit right now, and the 400 and 1,000 are being discussed in Hyperpilly. And so that way, the access movement, the, the, the movement of data has become very easy. So even if, if the data was not local and you had to move it, that is possible today, okay? So that is one thing is the high speed has helped a lot. Second thing is the virtualization, and the next four, five slides on virtualization, so I will, and then the, so I will, you know, go more detail later. And then there is software-defined networking and network function virtualization. Now, these modules will be taught in more detail in the next part of this course, but I will give you just one slide um, summary today as part of this lecture. Virtualization. So five things have happened in virtualization. First, the computation has been virtualized. The storage has been virtualized. And then the rack storage connectivity, I mean, and I will explain all of these five things in the next few slides, but now you can have the rack storage so that it can appear local to any of the machines. And then the data center storage can appear local to any machine, and the metro and global storage can appear local to any machine, right, because of the virtualization. So first, virtualizing computation. And this, actually, again, again, it is a repeat for this particular class because we have discussed so much about virtualization, but the idea is that in the old days, when you move the machine, they change the subnet, and, and things were not easy to move. So you could not really move VMs very easy. And that, and and one of the things that made cloud computing possible is that now the VMs can be moved very easily. And so that is one thing is that with intern, with the with Ethernet extending the whole data center, you don't have to worry about um, any change in the addresses, and therefore the VMs can move freely, and um, and so the computation can be moved anywhere in the data center. Then second thing is that with the provider bridging and provider backbone bridging that we discussed, the Q and Q and, and Mac and Mac, the, the numbers of these machines can be handled as well. Previously, you could not handle you know, millions of machines or millions of um, VLANs. Now, with those standards, the numbers, uh, we can handle really big, big uh, cloud data centers. Virtualizing storage. So the first thing the, the, the networking people did to enable data center cloud computing is to get rid of the fiber channel. Remember, previously, every computer needed to have two cards, one fiber channel card for, data, for storage and one Ethernet card for networking. And, um, and so basically, IEEE worked hard to make sure that everything that the fiber channel gives can be gotten by the Ethernet. So all these new standards which came out just in the last two, three years basically made that possible. And you might remember that we discussed the priority-based flow control and enhanced transmission selection, et cetera, et cetera, how they make Ethernet now provide the same, same um, basically capabilities that fiber channel provides for storage. So fiber channel is going away. And this unified networking basically um, saves a lot because now you don't need two cards. You can just have one card and, uh, and operator saving, op operator expenses as well. 
because the fiber channel is a very special field. Very few people know fiber channel where Ethernet is basically everybody knows. Anyway, the next thing was to to virtualize the rack storage connectivity. And now here comes the SRIOV, and I don't know whether some of you remember, but SRIOV is a single root I/O virtualization where you could have one PCI card, and it will have the it will create many PCIe cards, right? Virtual PCIe cards. And so here, what I have shown is that there is a disk which is connected to the PCI card, and you can divide the disk into red and blue and uh, and other colors. And the red VM thinks that it is connected to a disk which is a red color, and the blue disk and blue VM thinks that it has a blue PCI which is local. So you can see now that the <coughs> that, that any VM can make the disk any part of the disk local. So this is how the 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 data node and the task nodes both and um, basically can be on the same VM <coughs> because we can we can just by virtualizing properly move the data to the node that needs it. So so the idea is that this SRIOV really helped um, create the second thing was the multi-root IOV. Which actually made it even better. With multi-root IOV, you did not need the PCIe card on every machine. You just need a few PCIe card in the rack, and therefore those and those parts of the rack will have some disk, and those disks can be now shared anywhere in the rack. All right. So now you can see the VMs reach, and this is all to make the make the data local. That now any part of the disk you can say well this this part of the disk belongs to this VM and so on and so forth and therefore um, you can easily adjust I mean the location of the data as well as as well as the computation and notice that no data was moved that is the beauty of it is that while we are changing the location of the data the data is not being moved and then if the data was not in the same rack. Then Ethernet comes to help. <coughs> Ethernet comes to help by the the bridge port extension, where everything basically is within one hop, logical one hop, and so storage could be anywhere, and then it will appear local. Although in this case, the data will move. Because if the disk is at the other end of the data center, and you are doing computation at the, some other end, the data will have to be moved, but at a very high speed and and at at basically less complexity of computation. The programming, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, is all you know hidden. So this bridge port extension helps by making the whole everything connected to the same switch. And then the same story can be said about the metro storage. If the if the if the storage in some other part of the city in some other data center, we have these um, in these um, standards. Now I haven't discussed. I think VXLAN, NVGRE, Trill, etc. in this course. Um, and I have actually the lectures on that. And someday we will come back to virtualization more. Right now we need to move on. Um, but these are the standards which allow you to connect data centers. And with these standards, which are being done in IETF, um, you can connect data centers which are located across the city, are located in different cities, and they will appear as one Ethernet. So your one Ethernet can extend the city, it can extend the country, and as we see in the next slide, it can extend the world. All right, so that is the next slide, virtualizing the global storage, and um, so this is already being done. Energy Sciences Network, ESNet uses a virtual switch to connect members located all over the world. So they might have the disk located in Japan, USA, France, Germany, whatever countries. And and what they do is they set up a virtual Ethernet switch. So everything appears like it is connected to one switch. And, um, and, and that basically makes the use very simple, although in this case, I mean, the data has to move, and you need really high-speed worldwide networks. But um, 
but the thing is the the use and the programming and other things are much easier because if everything look is local then you know you don't have to worry about the details of you know how the data has to be moved from this location to that location so in general because of the virtualization the networks have become what we call fluid they are liquid and you can shape them in any way you want wherever you want and as a result the world i mean like they say the world is flat so the network has become flat and you draw your own network everything is virtually local so you can just draw what you want local what you want remote so you know as opposed to previously you had to worry about how things are connected but that detail is now hidden from the user so the question is and uh, when you say draw means can you design the network the way you want it yeah so all the virtualization stuff allows you to put the switches anywhere right virtual switches so you could say well i want the router between these two and i don't want the router between these and these has to be on the same network and so any kind of things you can do yeah so you can do by orchestration or you can do by you know whatever way you want but basically you can have an overlay that looks exactly the way you want it the underlay the physical network is different and you don't have to worry about that physical network connectivity